Haruka, we're live now, right? Yes, the meeting is live. Well, good afternoon, uh, committee members, staff, and uh, visitors. Um, I'd like to begin our meeting as we usually do by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kmaq, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We recognize the peace and friendship treaty signed between the British Crown and the Mi'kmaq. We're all treaty people and we have rights and responsibilities as Mi'kmaq and settlers alike. And today we're especially mindful of our Aboriginal friends who've had their past uh, pains and hurts resurrected by the discovery of all the um, unmarked graves on residential school sites. So I'd like to uh, now call the meeting to order and just acknowledge that we have received regrets from Hanin al Noman, from Lily Baraclough, from Councillor Stoddard, and from staff members Carolyn Hemstock and Tracy Jones Grant. So uh, let's begin with the approval of the uh, minutes of the previous uh, meeting. Um, could I have a motion to accept the minutes as circulated or are there any, uh, I should say, are there any changes or amendments, corrections that need to be made? If none, could I have a motion to accept the minutes as circulated? I'll accept it. Oh, oh, sorry. So I see Mallory will accept uh, Mallory as a uh, uh, mover and Holly, could, would you be happy to second that motion? Yeah, I'll second. Okay. Uh, all those in favor, could you indicate by saying aye? Aye. aye. Any opposed, say nay. Motion has been put and passed. Uh, the next item is the approval of the order of business. And I just want to let you know that um, item number, a couple of things, item number 9. Point, let me get it in my hand, 9.1, the staff report. Uh, because Carolyn and Tracy are absent today, we will just have a written report. And uh, you've all received that. So that item will, will pass very quickly. The um, next item that uh, will not happen is item 9.2.2. Hanin has been preparing uh, a presentation on anti-Islamophobia. Uh, Isla and um, she unfortunately is not feeling well today and is not able to be with us. So uh, that uh, agenda item will be postponed to another meeting. So could I have um, a motion to accept the uh, agenda as amended with that would be the item 9.2.2 has been deleted. Mm. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, just a quick question. I just saw that uh, Tracy Jones Grant has, has joined. Does that mean that the 9.1.2, uh, the update on the Office of Diversity and Inclusion will go ahead as, uh, as an oral update? I, when we get that to that item, we'll give her the opportunity to speak, but I'm not going to remove it from the agenda. I was just to kind of giving a heads up. Is that satisfactory? Cool. Perfect. That satisfactory? No, just that clarifies. Thank you very much. Okay. I'll, I'll move that the, uh, I'll move that the uh, order of business uh, as amended be, uh, be approved. And can I have a seconder for that one? Christine, thank you for that. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. Motion is carried. All right. The next uh, item is just uh, number four, business arising from the minutes. And I just would like to report to you, uh, you will have seen in the minutes, we, the, the committee requested that I reply to Jody Brown with the sentiments that were expressed by the committee and that uh, response has gone to Jody Brown. It went some time ago. Um, number five is a declaration of any conflict of interest. Anybody having seen the agenda? Have you got any conflicts of interest? Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, there's no deferred business and there's no correspondence to deal with. So that takes us right to our presentation. So I'm really um, happy that we're able to have Brianna Miller 
here with us. Um, this is a continuation of some of the study or work that we have done on the uh, issue of um, issues facing immigrants and newcomers to, um, to the Halifax community. Brianna is the coordinator of the um, Gender-Based Violence Prevention Project, which is uh, based at the YMCA Center for Immigrant Programs. So I'm going to turn the ag agenda over to Brianna. She's going to present for 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll have our usual opportunity to go around the table and make comments or ask her any questions. So Brianna, welcome, and uh, I'll turn, turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I just really want to appreciate and thank you all for letting me come and present today. Um, I did have a PowerPoint. I'm not sure if it's going to be put up. I think Haruka will yes, look after you. Okay. Yes, no problem. So yes, thank you so much. So my name is Brianna Miller and my pronouns are she and her. And as mentioned, I do work at the YMCA Center for Immigrant Programs. And the program that I coordinate is the Gender Based Violence Prevention Project. So we are funded by IRCC. Um, we can go to the next slide. For those who are not familiar, the YMCA Center for Immigrant Programs, we are part of the YMCA of Greater Halifax and Dartmouth, but our specific service supports newcomers to Nova Scotia, and we support uh, youth, family, and children with their various settlement needs. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I'll kind of give you an overview of some of those programs. So as you can see, we have many different programs and we're always growing, which is exciting. Um, but our programs, we have things like Saturday study skills for newcomer children, we have youth programs, we have settlement workers in schools, we also have rural settlement workers, um, and then of course we have those one-on-one -on -one supports for like employment, mobile crisis, um, and we also have programs for adults and families like active living. Um, our program, the Gender-Based Violence Prevention Project, uh, we kind of work across all of the programs. So we do offer kind of gender-based violence prevention programming to newcomer clients of all ages. So sometimes we'll do this in the form of special projects, events, um, or programs, or sometimes we'll use a program in a pre-existing program to offer a place-based kind of prevention model. So we might go into the school, or we might go into the youth program or into the language class. Um, and so that's kind of part of what we do. And so our project, the Gender-Based Violence Prevention Project, we do two things. We do prevention programming with newcomer clients to raise awareness around gender-based violence as a topic, the supports and services, as well as trying to focus on prevention work. And the other part of our work is we do try to build capacity for other people in the communities who work with newcomers to better understand the unique needs um, uh, and unique needs and challenges newcomers may face around this work and how they can also incorporate prevention into their work as well. Next slide, please. So why do we focus on prevention? So our model is we understand that gender-based violence is a very complex topic you know, it includes many different forms of violence, including family violence, violence against LGBTQ populations, violence against women, sexualized violence, human trafficking. There's just many, many different forms. And we know that it's really a complex issue uh, here in Canada and globally. So what we do with prevention is we try to focus on what are the things that are contributing or supporting it to exist. So we start thinking and with our newcomer clients to how can isolation, isolation might be a contributing factor. Um, you know, lack of awareness of services could be a, a factor. Uh, trauma or the settlement process kind of disrupting families could, could be a factor. So we really do our prevention programming by focusing on kind of these things, these pillars in this image, if you think about the little squares, holding up gender-based violence. So we try to think what's allowing gender-based violence to exist and if we start to tackle some of these pillars, we may be able to slowly kind of disrupt and take down gender-based violence. So that's kind of how our prevention programming works. So sometimes it might be direct awareness about the subject, and sometimes it might be a few steps back around empowerment of women or uh, healthy masculinity and things like that. Next slide. 
So I do want to acknowledge that gender-based violence occurs in all communities. So regardless of um, socioeconomic status, the country someone's from, their age, age race, religion, uh, sexual orientation, and many other factors. So we know that gender-based violence happens across the board. However, there are certain communities that are disproportionately affected, and we need to be mindful of kind of the systemic structures that make that happen. So whether it's racism, colonialism, things like this. Um, so this makes certain people at a higher risk of experience violence, as well as having more challenges to accessing barriers, um, accessing supports and services, sorry. So if you look at these, women and girls are obviously at a higher risk of experiencing gender-based violence, but also indigenous populations, 2SLGBTQIA+, um, and many others. And you will also notice newcomers is in that list. And we focus on newcomers because we're an immigrant organization, but there are many organizations that are prioritizing the other populations as well. Next slide. So it's important for us to kind of be aware of some of the challenges that newcomers experience. And I do want to acknowledge that obviously no two newcomers uh, experience the same challenges. We're not saying everyone's the same, but these are some general challenges kind of to think about. So uh, isolation is a really big one. If someone's coming to a new country, they don't have those supports and connections in the community. They don't really know where things are. Um, that can really impact someone. We also know that racism is prevalent in Nova Scotia. So that's, that is a, a big issue too. Loss of income and status can also be a really big challenge for our newcomers, um, particularly those who may have had a previous employment or a certain status in their community. And then when they come here, they're struggling to get a job. This can really impact a lot of newcomers' sense of self-worth, their mental health. It can also put a financial strain on the families. And also we notice it impacting our newcomer men particularly as well, who may feel a responsibility to provide for their families. Um, there's also, if we think of the youth, they experience unique barriers too. And I kind of want to highlight two of them. One is the shifting of family roles, which we, we see often. So newcomer children and youth tend to settle faster than their parents. They learn the language faster, they adapt faster, um, partially, I think, because of school and things like this. And so we notice that children and youth are taking on roles that maybe their parents would have been taking on at home. Um, so maybe now it's a child advocating for their housing needs or going to the bank or translating at a doctor's appointment. This shift of family roles can sometimes cause some challenges in the families as well, because suddenly the parents have to rely on their child all the time, which can cause, you know, it's hard for a parent to have to do that, as well as children and youth may be taking on responsibilities that are a little bit higher than their age group. So this can cause the shift in family roles and also this balancing of cultural identities. Oftentimes when newcomers come to a new country, they really wanna hold on to their traditions and values, which is important huge important part of identity but a youth will suddenly be thrown into a school environment where as we know even a canadian born youth struggles to fit in there's a lot of pressures to wear the same clothes do the same things everyone's dating and on social media and different things and so we notice the youth feel like they have to balance these two cultural identities the one that maybe their peers in schools are kind of pressuring them and the home so this can also feel really um, hard around identity for some of the youth uh, so I'm not going to go into the rural areas, but obviously there's increased challenges for rural communities. So when we think about these challenges, we have to ask ourselves, what organizations are currently supporting these needs of isolations, income, things like this? How could some of these contribute to being more vulnerable to experiencing gender-based violence? So how can someone whose family just lost a lot of their loss of status and income, struggling to find a job, uh, you know, no social networks, they're isolated. How could that make someone more vulnerable to gender-based violence? And how can these challenges impact someone's ability to access supports and services? So these are questions that we, we explore a lot in our project. Next slide, please. We do also want to acknowledge that those newcomers who are part of the 2S LGBTQIA plus community face additional challenges and barriers. So we know homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia are part of gender-based violence. Um, and while 77 countries in the world still criminalize same-sex activity, this can add to kind of stigma and shame and fear of kind of like 
being out in the community and fear of persecution, um, even here once they arrive in Canada. But also we know that Canada also has a lot of these challenges, homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia exist here too. So newcomers who are part of this community face additional challenges because now they need to find supports and services that are culturally and religiously and maybe um, aware of newcomer needs as well as are LGBTQ uh, friendly and aware of those unique needs as well. Next slide. So when someone experiences gender-based violence who's a newcomer, you know, there's a lot of barriers to accessing supports and services that we need to be really mindful of. Some of these you'll notice are echoed kind of from the original just challenges and barriers of newcomers. Um, but it's important that we, we see those similarities of, of why. So one of the thing is we do know that people who are isolated, it's gonna be harder to reach out for help, harder for them to have support networks, to feel confident. Um, to leave if they need to. They won't know what services are available. There's a lack of knowledge of community services. There's a mistrust and fear of systems. Many of our newcomers may be coming from countries where there's a lot of corruption. So people in uniforms, police and government may not be a trusted resource. Non-for-profits and humanitarian organizations may have also been part of corruption and violence in their home country. So they may not feel trusting and suspicious of organizations who ask too many questions, even if it is to try to get supports. Um, so there might be this. There's also this language um, and kind of like cultural barriers around accessing supports. So if an organization isn't aware of kind of those cultural or religious sensitivities, um, particular to this uh, kind of uh, situation, they might cause more harm or they might just uh, make it very obvious that it's not welcoming for them. So if a newcomer goes to an organization and they feel they have to justify their religion or their culture uh, for half of the time, they're not really getting the supports they need. So that can be really challenging as well. Immigration status concerns. Um, this can be used by perpetrators as a threat. Um, this, the threat of you're going to be deported or if I'm your sponsor, you're gonna be deported. So deportation concerns are also a really big fear, whether or not they're true, uh, whether they are at a risk or not. So again, there's kind of this mistrust of that as well. The fear of stigma from their own community. When people come to a new country, they often connect quickly with their cultural or religious community. And sometimes that's small. So it's really important for them to have people that's their support network. Um, so if someone's in an abusive situation, they may not want to leave their partner because they're nervous that if there's backlash from their community, they might be ostracized or isolated or blamed. And so there could be that fear of just like, maybe that's not worth it to them um, to, to kind of face that backlash of the community. So that's a fear as well that can sometimes happen. And we also know that there's concern for the family in a new community. A lot of people don't wanna perpetuate stereotypes. A lot of our newcomers are very aware of stereotypes that are based in racism, so they don't want to reinforce a stereotype of a certain community or a certain type of um, cultural background, and so they don't want to report these things and fear that it will back it will harm their community as well. Or potentially, if it's a newcomer, let's say a newcomer woman um, with children, she may not want to uh, leave her partner because she might be worried about the impact it could have on her children from being from a quote, a broken home, which could have impacts on the child for maybe getting married in the future and things like this. So there's lots of considerations that might um, limit someone's barrier uh, accessing supports and services. Next slide. So in our project, I'm not gonna to go too much into this, but I do want to acknowledge we do engage men and boys in our work. We believe that for far too long, gender-based violence prevention has predominantly been women, uh, which is great, but men need to be part of the solution. Um, otherwise, you know, statistically speaking, uh, it's, it's an important factor. So we do a lot of work with our young men and boys. We do a lot of like adult groups of men talks who talk about masculinity and mental health and gender equality. And we also do a lot of leadership groups with our boys and young men uh, around these things as well. So we do a lot of work with men and boys because we believe they can be part of the solution and, and need to be part of that as well. Next slide. And obviously we work with newcomer girls and women. So one of the big projects we did is the I'm Powered Girls Conference. So we had 21 newcomer girls from a variety of countries attend a, 
a kind of a conference in Tatamagush. And so we had uh, facilitators and staff from various cultural backgrounds and linguistic backgrounds that represented the groups we were working with. Um, and we engaged in a lot of these topics like balancing cultural identities. What is gender-based violence, consent, gender equality, and stereotypes? We also focused a lot on victim blaming, which was a big issue for our newcomer girls, this concept of labeling bad girls, what is a bad girl, and the idea that these people who are labeled bad often get ostracized and again, victim blamed um, and are at a higher risk of experiencing violence as well. So we did a lot of different things through art and acting and games um, to try to do this. And I do want to emphasize when working with newcomer girls, especially young women, it's really important to base it in cultural celebration. Um, and so we did a lot of awareness with the families about what we were talking about. We made it all women centered, even the staff, the chefs, the cooks, there was no men at this place at all, not even the cooks. Um, and that really made it accessible for the girls to show up. Um, and we really were really mindful that for a lot of newcomer clients, staying overnight was a big deal. So there's a lot of like best practices. These are two pages from a report that's free and online on our website if you wanted to learn more about this specific conference. Next slide. Obviously it can't just be a one-time thing. So we do engage newcomer women and girls continuously. So again, one of the things that I think we try to kind of combat is the stereotype that women's empowerment or when we talk about women's rights, somehow it has to be in contradiction with tradition and religion and values like this which is not the case. So we really try to root our work in celebrating where people are coming from, their religious values, their cultural values, to say that this actually is a strength of yours and how can how is that empowering in, in your own way? So we really try to root it in that. Um, so we do a lot of kind of um, culturally competent kind of programs and workshops that celebrate this. We do do a lot again around victim blaming, leadership opportunities for women to lead and to participate and to learn to speak about these issues and to educate other girls and women. We also do a lot of work around like talking about where to access supports and services. What if a friend is experiencing violence? We do a lot of that, what if a friend um, is experiencing violence? And we do a lot of uh, creating kind of supportive spaces where newcomer women can learn from each other and kind of create that peer supportive environment because newcomer women are the best experts for other newcomer women. So trying to create and facilitate processes where that can happen. So we do women's programming for adult women. Uh, we do girls programming pre-COVID in schools, in high schools and junior highs, as well as in our youth uh, programs, at, uh, after school youth programs as well. Next slide. And we also obviously do a lot of programming for like that are not gender specific. So I do want to acknowledge that um, gender specific programming can be exclusive sometimes to trans and non-binary uh, participants. So it's important that we have programs that are gender inclusive, but many of our clients do come from backgrounds where uh, gender segregation is, is, a, is more comfortable for them, especially talking about these sensitive subjects. So we try to do a balance of providing opportunities of like youth programming in general and girls and guys groups and like women and men programming and just adults. Uh, so we try to balance that need. So again, we do a lot of information and awareness through interactive activities. We focus a lot on connecting with other service providers because um, that's part of our role. So for example, during the pandemic, we connected with Alice House. Um, and so one of the things we really wanted to talk about was how do we address child protection issues and helping people understand around these things in a positive way. So we, Alice House um, did a collaboration with us around trauma-informed parenting, uh, which is really great because it acknowledged settlement is a traumatic, a traumatic process um, and how to navigate that. And so that was really great. So we do a lot of partnerships with other um, experts in the field. And also just try to do supportive activities to reduce isolation, kind of promotes positive mental well-being, create opportunities for families to connect uh, with each other, to supports and services, as well as just connect in the topic. Next slide. So this is just a two minute video um, and I did wanna show it. So it is 
I do want, so sorry, this is part of a forum theater video project. So we did engage 30 youth, uh, newcomer youth um, in a forum theater project. So for those who don't know, forum theater is basically where people come up with skits. Of course, this was around gender-based violence um, and they kind of have an unsolved problem. And then other youth have to try to step in the role of someone in the skit to try to solve it. So the youth created this as a learning opportunity and problem solving together, but also they presented it to other newcomer youth at conferences and as well as a, a national conference as well. And we made a video um, because we use the video now as a teaching tool, um, which is a full length video. So you're just gonna see the trailer as a teaser. You might have to allow sound on the video. If you click it as a YouTube link, uh, and then you might be able to allow sound then. Okay. Sorry, apologies. As it's just getting ready, I'll just acknowledge that forum theater is a great way to engage newcomers, especially with language barriers. Um, but I do want to acknowledge it was not done quickly. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. When you act it out, you're not really talking, but you're talking. So it's easier for us all to come together. And I find that the different acting games and acting like skills just bring us together as one and unite us. There's some of the topics we already like seen before. So yeah, like and how they act like that's really nice the way they act because they're trying to show you that it really happens in real life. What's about you go to your room, that's not of your business, I'm it's the dad, my business. that's I'm my house. Talking about how women and men be exactly the same thing, not different between them. Sometimes in some culture and stuff, they say, oh, man's like, oh, women have to stay home for a child and stuff, and men like have to work and bring money for the family and stuff. So we're just showing people like, like when even any newcomer or any like women, man is like same thing. What is this? What is this? That's my headshot. Whoa, why are you wearing whoa, whoa, whoa. it so whoa, whoa. Nice. We're learning something new and that help us like in our lives. Because if you just sit at home and not just sit at home, even though you go anywhere with your friends, you only talk about something funny or laugh about what happened in your school and stuff. But every time you come here, like you're learning about something new. I feel powerful and um, happiness and it's just a, it's something good. We can do the same thing in our real life. It doesn't have to be an act. It doesn't finish here. That's just kind of a teaser of a larger video that's free and available on YouTube. I do want to acknowledge, obviously, we didn't throw a bunch of youth together to act out violence. It was a very long process of like consent based um, skit building, as well as a very trauma informed, skilled organization um, that kind of like led this project. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, but we can. Yeah. Other than that, I think I just had one last slide. Oops. Sorry, maybe I've messed it up now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Right, so I uh, just wanted to acknowledge, so our program, we do a lot of great work and we try to use our best practices and we do acknowledge that gender-based violence is everyone's responsibility. So while our program does focus on it, we really try to make it part of all of the programs at the Y, as well as we try to teach, as I said, free workshops and webinars to other service providers around this topic because we, we believe that it's our role to build capacity of Nova Scotia. So we try to like speak about this issue, raise awareness. 
We also try to challenge the norms and policies and systems that kind of perpetuate oppressions um, and contribute to gender-based violence. So we really focus on kind of cultural humility and being trauma-informed, anti-oppressive, anti-racist. And we really try to be aware of the unique needs of newcomers and particularly around gender-based violence. Uh, and obviously supporting victims and survivors is, is at the forefront of our work and trying to be really victim-centered as well. And the last slide. So this is my contact information. So again, my name is Brianna and I am the coordinator of this project. We are part of a larger team. So we have staff who lead our men and boys program, uh, another facilitator who leads some of our uh, women and girls and youth programs, as well as we are part of a national strategy, which is very exciting. So my manager, uh, Catherine bates Khan, is the chair of a national strategy for the settlement sector on gender-based violence. So we're a part of that as well. But if anyone ever wants to reach out for a free training or webinar or just wants more information, here is my contact information. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the time to, to do a short presentation with you all. Thank you, Brianna. That was, uh, that was wonderful. That was very, very uh, information filled. An excellent presentation. So as I mentioned to you, what we do is we go kind of go around the table, so to speak, alphabetically, and uh, people will be able to make comments or ask questions and so on and so forth. So um, Lisa Blackburn, Councillor Blackburn is first up here. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you so much for that presentation. I, It's one of those things that, uh, you know, the why does so many things, but to see it that detailed and, and to see, you know, some of the programs that are out there, it's mind blowing what you guys are able to do. Uh, and also it's, it's very good to see that, uh, you know, that you engage men and boys and recognize the role that they play in preventing gender violence. And uh, I think that, you know, that's it's a great, great step to, uh, to uh, you know, for all of us to recognize the responsibilities we have. Um, just wondering, you know, you kept mentioning isolation over and over. And, and you know, the first thing that I thought of was the, the isolation that COVID has uh, led to. So I'm just wondering if there's been an increase in demand for these preventative services because of COVID. Uh, and is that meant a strain on your resources? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And thank you also for the acknowledgement of, of the work that we're doing. Um, COVID definitely was a huge challenge for our organization as a whole, um, just because our immigrant center has, for, for many newcomers, is the main support that they're getting. So when the doors mm -hmm. closed, uh, a lot of our newcomers were left in the dark. What's happening? Things were not being translated. Uh, there was all of a sudden a lot of needs um, and, you know, even schools shutting down and people not knowing how to do school yeah. online. There was just a lot. Um, so, of course, the isolation did impact our clients a lot of we noticed a lot of increase of mental health crises, um, the financial strain definitely impacted families. Um, and we did our mobile crisis workers um, also at our organization deal with kind of the intervention. Um, they did note that there was an increase uh, in domestic violence uh, supports needed and family violence. Um, and they, they also noted that most of the time it was related to this kind of like added financial stress and, and yeah. isolation. So yes, we did notice and we did have to think strategically, how do you give prevention programming when people might be at home yeah. uh, with family members? So we have to be really strategic in the way we worded our programming online because it's different than if we just yeah. have someone show up. So yeah, we did have to be strategic yeah. and yeah, there was more. Yeah, because it's certainly the... Uh, you know the the arrival of uh, of new Haligonians that that didn't stop during COVID. Uh, it might have slowed a bit, but certainly did not stop. We continued to welcome many many new families. So uh, appreciate the efforts that you guys went uh, above and beyond to uh, help uh, help these new Haligonians feel welcome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Tanya, do you have some comments or questions? don't have any at this time, but thank you, Brianna, so much for your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Charla's, uh, Charla, have you, has Charla joined us? I'm not sure. No, I don't see a Charla. So that takes us to Mallory. Mallory, do you have questions or comments? Yeah, um, Brianna, thank you. Wonderful presentation, and it's lovely just to see the work that you and your team are doing. Um, you had mentioned about 
being in schools and um, even showing up sometimes to schools. I'm just wondering, do you do any other forms of advertising, whether paid or not paid? But are you are how do you how do you get to the schools? And I guess are there any other resources or places that you could be that would need your services but just don't know yet? Yeah, so that's a good question. So part of our initial kind of partnering would obviously be with our pre-existing programs as part of the YA Immigrant Center. So one of our programs is school settlement workers. So we actually have full-time staff or part-time staffs in I think over 20 something schools in HRM. So we have a YMCA worker in the schools. So that makes it easier for us because they have a relationship with clients. They can call us and be like, hey, we think that an assembly would be really great for grade fives. Or actually, can you do a a high school girls group and talk about some of these issues or a boys group or whatever. Um, as for like out, other outreaches, yeah, we, we are constantly trying to look how to engage other newcomers. We started trying to see how we could engage rural, like um, rural communities a little bit more. So we are connecting to our Y reach workers that work in rural areas, but it is an area we need to explore a little bit more. We're very open to partnering with anyone. <laughs> Um, as long as, you know, we can access newcomers in the process, but currently we're mostly connecting to our pre-existing um, relationships and programs. But it's a good question. Uh, we're always open to seeing if you have suggestions on ways we can connect with other people, we'd be more than happy to, to learn that. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Mallory. Holly, do you have some questions or comments? I do, yeah. First, thank you so much for the presentation. It was, you were a fantastic presenter and it was a very engaging presentation. And I learned a lot about the services that are offered. And like Councillor Blackburn said, I hadn't realized there was just so much more <laughs> that you, you folks are doing. So thank you. Uh, my question for you um, is related to some of the work that we've been doing as a committee. And that's been um, being involved with the United or the UN uh, Safe City Safe, Sp Safe Spaces Program. And I was wondering if in your work, um, if you see or hear about more reports of gender-based violence, perhaps in public spaces, or if it's mostly happening in maybe private households, or I'm just wondering if maybe you can comment more on that. Good question. Um, I, so as an organization, like I'm not sure what the why necessarily would say, but I know at least from the mobile crisis workers, they're seeing a lot of mostly like in private spaces and, and family kind of contexts. We did do a focus group with our youth outreach program, not on gender-based violence, but on violence in general. And we did notice a lot of the youth saying online spaces um, and schools uh, where, where a lot of, and a lot of it was gendered. Um, so that was something to consider. So I don't know if I can necessarily speak on everything just because we do focus mostly on prevention, so I wouldn't have necessarily all the statistics. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's across the board, similar to most of the populations here uh, in Halifax as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Holly. Uh, Christine, do you have uh, comments or questions? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It's very informative. And uh, uh, as you mentioned about a little bit about uh, mental health and uh, isolation, and myself as a, a newcomer, and I think uh, especially for newcomer, uh, both like men and women, I, I, I think uh, the mental health issue is a challenge and many people may not be open to ask for help and uh, I'm curious uh, what what's the like a uh, wise approach like to encourage more uh, immigrants or newcomers to ask for help uh, if they face any kind of uh, mental health uh, challenge or issue that's a great question and you're absolutely right so in our approach with our gender-based violence prevention project we try to we try to avoid using words that would automatically bring kind of this stigma. So sometimes we won't word things as mental health or mental illness or things like this. We might talk about healthy families or um, something or managing a stressful time or something, but we will end up talking about the impacts of kind of depression and things and, and add resources into it. So one of the ones we did with, with our men, we actually did a few sessions around mental health and, and 
slowly they did open up. So I think it was really trying to start with a subject people are comfortable with, whether it was just like the pressures that men are facing in a new country, uh, and then slowly adding, how does that, that impact you? And so it kind of talks into mental health and then continue. Um, our organization's best practice in general is we're relationship-based. So our entire service is really based on the relationships of clients. Um, so a lot of our programs you'll notice is that uh, sometimes it'll take a few programs of like art programs or recreation programs or whatever it is. So our clients get comfortable with us and that's when they'll feel more comfortable to reach out. So we do a lot of like arts-based rec-based programming, building that relationship with clients, slowly adding in some stuff around mental health um, or, you know, gender-based violence or whatever this topics we want. And slowly people will start to feel more comfortable to be like, oh, we can ask you about that. Oh, oh okay. Uh, and that's how we do it. So we try to kind of bring it in eas easily, um, but really based on relationships, um, definitely. Thank you. Thanks. It's a good question though. Um, it's just double checking. I'm just gonna circle back Tanya, just to make sure you have nothing's come to mind in the, the discussion that's gone on so far. No, nothing in mind. Everybody's asked great questions. So thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, uh, Brianna, I just want to echo again what other people have said. You know, it's a very impressive work that you are doing. Uh, I think when we talked earlier, uh, you and I had a conversation. Uh, I let you know that, you know, we are the, an advisory committee to the uh, city council. So that's our role. Um, to serve as an advisory committee for the HRM's Council on Gender Issues. And we determined that in order to fulfill our responsibility, it was important for us to understand uh, better uh, issues facing women. And, and one of the groups that we're concerned about are immigrants and, and newcomers. Uh, so I'm just curious if you would give me, I think, Maybe, maybe I didn't know there, so you didn't speak about this. Just um, give us a little background in how long your organization has been active in the Halifax regional area, how many years, and sort of the number of, I think you said that five people are, are employed, but tell us a little bit more about that and, and kind of give us an idea of the numbers of, uh, of clients, if you've got that, uh, that information handy. I apologize, I probably won't have the exact numbers, but I know that the YMCA has been around for a very long time and the YMCA Immigrant Services has been over, I know it's been over 25 years, the exact year, I apologize, I don't have it oh, right with me, but yeah. it's been an active, a very active organization in, in supporting newcomer settlement. Um, and we did for a long time, primarily focus on children and youth was a, a pretty big focus, um, but we've, we've since quite expanded um, the number of clients we work with is uh, in the thousands, but I, I don't have the exact number again. Um, so I apologize for that, but you know that, that helps. I'm we, just, yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to figure is it but, hundreds or thousands that helps? Yeah, I mean, like Nova yeah. Scotia settles a lot of people. So if you think of each, we have like, you know, in every school, how many newcomers are in each school and each one of those people has families. And then, you know, I, I work in another program uh, as well on Saturday uh, for the ch small children's program. And that program alone, we have like 50 kids showing up. So there's quite a lot. Um, our gender-based violence prevention project, our program's quite new in the grand scheme of the immigrant services. So we started in 2017. It was a pilot project um, and then it kind of got renewed and into more funding to kind of implement. It started as research and kind of developing resources and, and a professional training and, and manual actually. Um, and then now it's been like implementing that more into client work, more like, okay, let's deliver, let's do more of that prevention programming and see where it goes. And, and a specific focus on engaging men and boys was part of the, the new funding for the next few years. So we're, we're fairly new since 2017 of the GBVP project. So we're a small team, but the YMCA Center for Immigrant Programs were very large. Um, not as large as ISENS, but we're, we're large in, in our programs and capacity. Um, so yeah, but you can see our website, I think a full list of our programs and each program probably has multiple staff uh, at least, and some are over 10 plus, um, like particularly in our school settlement and Y reach programs. Okay, thank you. And, and if I understood you correctly, you're part of a network 
uh, nationally, right? That mm -hmm. focuses on GBV across the yeah. So there's, um, there is a gender-based violence national strategy within the settlement sector. So within working with newcomers um, across Canada and uh, my manager at the Y, who used to actually be the coordinator of this program, is the chair of the national strategy. So we have been informing the national strategy of our work. We also have been part of presenting and developing some of their manuals and modules as well. So we are um, part of that as well, which is exciting. But the national strategy is also uh, really important work because I think it's trying to look at the whole country to see what are the best practices across the country? What are our priorities? And, and trying to make some consistent consistency in our, in our practices of gender-based violence with working with newcomers. Great, thank yeah. you. So I guess the last thing I would just comment and, and, and I, you don't need to answer this now if it's not top of mind, but you might wanna think about it is, um, so just if there's things that um, you think the HRM could be doing or we as a women's advisory committee um, may wanna to bring to uh, council's attention that would be helpful in your work. So we, we, as I said, we're an advisory committee. And um, if there's things that come to your mind that uh, in the future that you think um, we could be uh, play, a, play a role, um, no harm in asking. Yeah, and I, I won't answer it right away, of course, but, uh, but I do think that something that's always useful is, um, and I'm glad to see there, there is some representation, but when thinking of uh, a newcomer uh, women, particularly if that's the focus of your council to to really try to find ways to engage more newcomer women representation on your committee um, or to engage more focus groups of newcomer women from different populations as i mentioned different populations the somali community needs very different things than the syrian community different things so really um part of your committee could be reaching out to cultural groups and and, and uh, trying to understand the the needs specific to those population. So that would be my first recommendation. Um, but otherwise, I, I, I can send you some recommendations as well from our organization once I think about it. But representation and first voice is always um, very useful, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Brianna. I really appreciate that. I learned a lot as uh, other members have indicated. And uh, obviously, you have great passion for your work, which you have conveyed. And that's, uh, that's really great. So thanks for making time to be with us today. No problem. And I just want to thank you all for your time. And again, please, if anyone does want to continue a conversation, you can reach out and we do offer free, you got a glimpse of it, but free three hour trainings around um, this topic and this work. So if you got a little excited about it or want to learn more, um, you can reach out. We have a lot of free training opportunities uh, and we can center it based on whatever your work is. Um, so thank you so much. I just really appreciate your time and thank you for your questions and comments as well. Thanks, Brianna. Thank you. All right, moving on with our agenda. Um, there are no information items being brought forward. So that brings us to the item um, 9.1.1, an update on GBA and update on the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. And I see Tracy's cheery face there. So Tracy, would you like to uh, uh, provide us with a, with a brief uh, verbal update? That would be great, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, Caroline was not feeling well today, so she did uh, have Haruka send you her update. Um, I don't have anything particular to add, but I do think that it's exciting that the two um, recommendation reports will be going to the Executive Standing Committee uh, on July the 12th. So those are the two reports that this committee had um, wanted, uh, had suggested that all of council members have GBA plus training and all of um, municipal staff have GBA plus training. So when those, um, and I think uh, Councillor Blackburn, if I'm not mistaken, those documents for council on the 12th will go live on the 9th on our website, if I'm, yes. That is correct, yep. So um, please feel free to, to look at those. It took us a little bit of work and, and um, it's not an easy thing to request mandatory training for 
uh, 4,000 employees, uh, nor is it easy for us uh, as staff to dictate what kind of training counselors have. So we think we've reached a, a happy medium with our, our, our report that's going forward. Um, Caroline has been working diligently on developing the GBA Plus Toolkit. Uh, I've had the opportunity to look at that, to provide editing. We're now going to be piloting some um, training to just see if it works. And then we'll be rolling that out in the organization. And again, that was a massive piece of work that she led uh, uh, for us. And I'm really pleased with that. It's now currently sitting with communications so that we can pretty it up and make it readable and those types of things. Other than that, our office continues to move forward. Um, Caroline uh, managed to roll out module four with Halifax Regional Fire on gender equity. Uh, she's now getting ready to work with individuals in fire to do a train the trainer program so that we can roll things out within stations. So each station I believe will have people who will have a better knowledge of um, gender equity, which is really what we want. Um, and as we are going through a fire recruitment, I'm sure that we will see more women that will show up in our, our upcoming recruitment. So it's exciting times, I would say, in the municipality. I think um, the one thing that I wanna say, and I don't know if I told the team this, but we did recently pass French language services strategy and we're now looking, questions came from council about multilingualism. So I've now pulled together a team to prepare a report for council on uh, multilingualism. And I guess the, the, what I want to close with is um, as exhausted as I am, I'm really feeling excited about the work of diversity, equity, inclusion. And I really appreciate knowing that there's the Women's Advisory Committee who are listening to our constituents and therefore able to shape some of those conversations that we're bringing to regional councils. So that's pretty much my update. And if anybody has any questions for me, I'm open. Thank you, Jane. Well, thank you, Tracy. That's, uh, that's an exciting report. Thank you. Um, I'll just quickly go around in case anybody has any comments or questions for Tracy. Um, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, no, uh, no questions, but just a, a quick comment and a, and a thank you. I uh, uh, recently just uh, had to, and Tracy mentioned the recruitment from uh, fire services and uh, uh, recently had a, uh, um, a woman who had uh, passed all of the, uh, the paperwork tests for fire, but uh, was uh, just, just waiting to get the physical, but uh, she was uh, pregnant and uh, couldn't make the, uh, the date that had been established. And uh, uh, with the help of diversity and inclusion, we were able to uh, get her in to uh, have the physical when it was uh, physically possible for her to do so. So uh, you know what, we, uh, we make uh, little steps every day in, uh, in furthering uh, uh, accommodation and, uh, and assistance for, uh, for women in uh, non-traditional roles. So uh, thank you to Tracy and the team for helping with, uh, with that resident. Great. You're more than welcome. Glad we could be of some assistance. Tanya, any, any comment, questions? No comment at this time, but thank you both for that update and that okay. information. Uh, Mallory, any? No questions, thank you. Okay, Holly? No questions, um, but I agree it's quite exciting, so thank you. And Christine? Um, uh, Tracy, I just want to uh, congratulate many exciting uh, initiatives from your office. And at the same time, I also want to uh, follow up uh, for my uh, uh, previous presentation. I'm just curious, uh, uh, there's uh, two items. One is on the data collection, uh, kind of partnership probably with organization like uh, Engage North Scotia. Another idea is... Uh, is on, uh, for example, online uh, information campaign. And, and I received an email yesterday from Haluka. She, I think the 211 was a number that available for the, for the provincial level. So I'm wondering, there's any kind of collaboration probably between the province and city uh, make this information available for uh, people who may need 
this number and kind of, uh, yeah, so that's my question and comment. Um, so to your first question, oh, sorry, um, we're really excited to say that we have partnered with Engage to um, pull together data on women's experience in HRM. So that will be rolled out to my team on um, the on the 13th of July, and then um, we'll roll it out to the organization and we're really looking forward to sharing that. Um, we had them do a deep dive into their survey and pull out specifically information related to women's experiences. So that's something that we will have shortly. Um, as far as 211 and Councillor Blackburn, you may be able to uh, assist me with this. I am not sure what the relationship is between the municipality and provincial 211. Um, mm. So I'm not too sure, um, Christine, I can answer. Councillor Blackburn, I'm not too sure. Yeah, I don't think we have any formal connection with 211, um, other than the fact that, uh, you know, we, we usually get a, a yearly uh, presentation from 211 just to uh, remind us of the services they provide. And uh, many of us, you know, many of the counselors send residents their way, but I don't think there's any uh, formal, uh, um, you know, agreement between uh, the municipality. Two on one is just, uh, as, as far as we know, is uh, strictly uh, the uh, the the one well, the one stop shopping number for uh, all things uh, provincial as far as social services is concerned. Right. Yeah. Um, so I really hope uh, that uh, there will be some sort of uh, kind of a information material will be available for not only anti-Asian racism, and like, uh, like the, any kind of a violence attack. And today, uh, unfortunately, Hanin is unable to make her presentation because she's not here, but I think this, all these issues kind of related. So yeah, so if uh, that's a way we can kind of uh, work toward to get a campaign and material available for the public soon, that would be great. I think uh, we can control any information that's coming out from the municipality. We don't have any say on what comes out from the province. Um, you know, if we develop something and there's an ability to share it with the province, um, but I, I just, there's kind of a, you know, we, we have a provincial network, um, uh, the associate uh, administrative, Administrators Association of Nova Scotia, part mm. of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities. Anyways, so they're kind of separate entities. I'm not sure if I'm explaining this correctly. So when we look at what comes out of our office or comes out of the municipality, um, it, it does tend to be a separate thing from, from the province. So we don't, it, I'll give you an example. When the province was communicating about COVID um, and the, there was lots of, um, they were starting to develop materials in, in multiple languages. Those were provincial materials uh, that we then shared, you know, through our networks, through our office, but we had no say on those materials or determining the languages or, or whatever. So am, am I making much sense? They're kind of two separate entities that do work together, but are kind of separate in, in their their work. Yes, certainly I understand it's like a two different jurisdictions. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I just hope uh, was because uh, the rising anti uh, kind of uh, racism, hate crime and uh, like uh, violence. And I hope uh, for the city level, if less more information or like uh, support mm -hmm. material could be available online or offline for the people who in need, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Tracy, for, for the, your comments and for your responses. Yeah, and you make perfect sense. <laughs> I understood it perfectly. Oh, let's need to move on now to the next item. Uh, that would be 9.2. And um, that is our um, response to the HRM's Strategy Review Committee, which has been circulated once 
And I do appreciate the many people that um, looked at it and came back with suggestions. And you've now received the second draft today. And at this point, I would just, um, if there are any questions or comments on what on that second draft, I, I'm welcome them. Uh, if there are none, we will just, uh, I'll ask for a motion that we proceed with submitting this as our uh, input to the HRM strategy review committee. So let me just go around the table again and just see if, uh, see what comments or questions you might have. Again, we'll start with you, um, Councillor Black. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I have nothing further to, uh, to uh, add to this. I, uh, as councillors, uh, we've seen this report at various committee levels, executive committee and whatnot. I've probably seen the, the presentation about five times now. So any of the questions that I have, I forget who I've asked them to, but they've all been answered. So <laughs> I'm, I'm good to go and uh, appreciate the, uh, the input from uh, the rest of the team. Uh, uh, some very good uh, points were made uh, and uh, certainly gives uh, Kate Green and the team uh, some, some good things to work on as they move forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Blackburn. Um, where am I at? Uh, Tanya, I think you submitted some things and I think I added them. I can't, um, you're good? I am good. I didn't make any changes, but I, uh, okay. all the feedback was great and it's well written, so thank you. Okay, good. And um, Mallory, I think, oh, Mallory, I do believe you had some input there. And so any comments, anything further? No, we're good. And Holly? Yeah, um, I thought that you did a great job writing it. All of the changes that people submitted, I think were reflected well in it. So I have nothing further. We're good to go, good. And Christine? Uh, I don't have any further changes, but I want to thank you, Jim, for taking the lead on this. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's. It, I just tried to do a synopsis of the comments that were made at the uh, at the previous meeting. So, I had lots of good ideas to work with. So, um, at this point, I'm. I would ask um, for a motion to uh, submit the um, report as circulated to the HRM Strategy Review Committee. And we will get that done before July 8th. Christine wants to make that motion. Is there a seconder? A second. Tanya, I think you got your second in there. And uh, so all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Motion is carried. Good stuff, thank you very much. And uh, so our last item of, uh, of substance is um, go back to Councillor Blackburn and if you could give us a little update on uh, the activities of City Council. We really appreciate sure these thing. updates. Oh, no problem at all. And I'll, I'll keep it quick. We've had uh, two council meetings and a committee of the whole meeting since uh, our last uh, Women's Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, at the June 8th uh, meeting, we started with the committee of the whole. And for those not familiar, uh, Committee of the Whole is sort of like uh, Regional Council Light. It, it's a little less formal. Uh, members, uh, the councillors have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, speak uh, a few times. Uh, the time constraints aren't as, as rigid, so it's, uh, it's usually a good place to have discussions. So uh, on June 8th, we started with that to have a discussion about the regional plan review. Um, and then uh, after that, we went directly into uh, our council meeting. And at that meeting, we approved the renaming of Cornwallis to Peace and Friendship Park and uh, have since had the, uh, the ceremony to, uh, to christen the new name. Uh, we also endorsed the anti-Black racism framework as developed by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. We voted to change our downtown parking program to help businesses recover post-COVID. Uh, we agreed to financially support the Switch Open Street event we passed a motion to continue funding and to reestablish the multi-service youth center in Lower Sackville. It's uh, commonly known to the kids as the Den, and uh, we also committed to explore other communities where similar centers could be established. And we also requested a staff report on developing a park lighting strategy. That might be something for, uh, for this committee to uh, keep an eye on as well, just looking at best practices for park lighting. And uh, once that report uh, comes in, we might want to have a look at it and, and weigh in. At our June 29th council meeting, we approved a bylaw that will establish a policy for roadside memorials 
on municipal roads, including a two-year time limit. Uh, council voted in favor of a symbolic motion to support local journalism, joining a list of municipalities across Canada in recognizing World Press Freedom Day. Uh, we approved a motion to move forward with the province on establishing a sobering center in HRM. And uh, this center would be an effort to keep people out of the traditional drunk tank and also uh, committed to examining existing alcohol policies and regulation at both the municipal and provincial levels. Uh, as Tracy mentioned, we passed the French language service strategy and requested to uh, have it uh, added into the budget process so it becomes a regular thing. And the goal is to be able to, as offer, to, be able to offer as many services as possible in French. And as Tracy uh, indicated, we're looking at other languages as well. We approved a funding request of $100,000 from Neptune Theatre. This was a one-time request because of uh, their uh, losses due to COVID. Uh, we also voted enthusiastically in favor of a detailed lake water quality monitoring program that will begin next spring. Uh, we also asked for a report to examine the possibility of a pilot program that would uh, provide shower facilities for people experiencing homelessness. We also voted in favor of a staff report that would outline a process and a timeline for developing friendship accords with uh, the Mi'kmaq Grand Council, the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs, and individual band councils uh, that we have uh, current or anticipated service agreements with. And we also asked for a staff report on developing a formal policy for the use of polygraph testing for hiring purposes. Uh, polygraph testing still being used in uh, some, well, in particular by HRP in their uh, hiring practices um, at, uh, at all levels. So uh, we're just sort of looking at, uh, at that and whether there's a need for it. And finally, we also approved a list of parks and recreation programs that would be submitted to the federal government for potential stimulus funding. And uh, that's uh, the, uh, the update on the last two council meetings, Madam Chair. My goodness, you have been busy. <laughs> <laughs> busy, busy. Thank you for that. Um, oh, anytime. And if there are any comments or questions, uh, if you just wave your hand at me, I'll... Nope. Oh, Tanya. Tanya yeah. would like yeah. to... Uh, thank you, Councillor Blackburn. Uh, you mentioned about us um, keeping an eye out for the park lighting strategy. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm also really intrigued on the shower stations for people experiencing homelessness and how we can yes. have an impact on that as well. Um, I don't know if this is a question for you, Council Blackburn or Jane. Uh, uh, how do we get our hands in that cookie jar or do we just have to ask to be part of that? Um, well, that's a that's a good question. Um, so once we ask for a staff report, it sort of starts the process and uh, all the reports are kept track of in something that we call report center. Um, I can look into when those reports are expected back, um, recognizing that uh, usually uh, we don't get, our uh, counselors don't get to see the reports until the Wednesday before uh, a council meeting. So we don't get a lot of uh, lead time on it, but I can certainly check into the, uh, the shower report and um, what was the, oh, the park lighting strategy. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll look in and see when they are expected back and uh, I'll, uh, I'll report back to, uh, to Jane on that. So she can uh, send that out to uh, the rest of the committee. Um, and, and then really it's just a, a matter of keeping an eye on, on when it's expected back and then, uh, you know, we'll, uh, maybe the, the clerk's office can uh, let us know when they're publicly available. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Sounds good. What else? All right. I think, I think we're good. So, um, that brings us to the close of our very brief meeting today. We, we had missed a, an important item here, so that's uh, that shortened our meeting considerably. Uh, I do wanna just mention that this is Holly's last meeting. Holly is leaving for parts west and uh, where she's going to be a student. 
uh, and working on her PhD program. Uh, she's won a prestigious uh, scholarship uh, to be able to do that. We're very proud of you, Holly. Uh, we are also very grateful for your contributions to this committee. You've been a great uh, contributor, ask great questions, make great comments, and uh, you've made a significant uh, contribution in a short time. So thank you very much for that. And we just wanna wish you all the best. We, we hope that, um, of course, we know that you'll be back. This is your home, <laughs> Nova Scotia's home, and uh, we expect to see you back one day. Um, but just the, in the meantime, we just our thoughts go with you and our warmest, warmest, best wishes. Thank you very much. I, uh, I really wish that we had the opportunity to meet in person <laughs> before I left, but that's okay. Um, I'm so glad that I was able to be a part of this group and uh, I'm looking forward to at least staying in touch and keeping tabs on all the changes and setting initiatives that go on. And, and you're right, Nova Scotia is home for me. So the plan is to come back after I complete my schooling in four years, but um, I will be in touch, of course. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing all the, the great things that the committee does. Yeah. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Uh, and so the next item is really the, just discuss the next meeting. No meeting in August. Uh, if Holly's taking off, well, we're not having a meeting. No, that's not true. <laughs> no, no meeting for August. And our September meeting is, um, it will take place on September 9th. If you've already put uh, dates in your calendar, you may have put in September 2nd, but uh, that's immediately, I think, before the long weekend or after. The, so I, I thought uh, I would prefer for us to meet on September 9th. So if you would put September 9th in your calendar and we will see you then unless there's any other issues or any other comments or questions anybody would like to make. Then just have the best summer ever enjoying this Nova Scotia beautiful summer, our beaches, our parks, our, our lovely, lovely uh, geography. I hope you stay well and uh, your family stay well and you have a very enjoyable summer and if I could have a motion for adjournment and we'll see you on September 9th. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, Councillor Blackburn. All right. Bye for now. Good luck. Goodbye everybody. Good luck, Holly. Thank you. Good luck, Holly. Thanks everyone. Bye.